Assalamualaikum dear participants. Welcome to this session of Moral Lessons from the Quran. Today we are going to study another passage from the Quran. I'm just going to share my screen with you and read out the text and translation of the passage that we are going to study today. This is a passage from Surah Ali Imran, the third surah, verses 130 to 136. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayuha al-lazina amanu la ta'akulu al-riba adhu'afa muza'afa wa attaku allaha la'allakum tuflihoon wa attaku al-nara al-lazhi u'iddat lil-kafirin wa atiyu allaha wal-rasool la'allakum turhamoon wa sari'u ila maghfiratin min rabbikum wa jannatin arduha al-samawatu wal-ard u'iddat lil-muttaqeen الذين ينفقون في السراء والضراء والكازمين الغيز والعافين عن الناس والله يحب المحسنين والذين إذا فعلوا فاحشة أو ظلموا أنفسهم ذكروا الله والذين إذا فعلوا فاحشة أو ظلموا أنفسهم ذكروا الله فاستغفروا لذنوبهم ومن يغفر الذنوب إلا الله ولم يسروا على ما فعلوا وهم يعلمون أولئك جزاؤهم مغفرة من ربهم وجنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها ونعم أجر العاملين Believers, if in future also you want God's help, do not consume this interest, doubling it many times over, and keep fearing God that you may prosper, and protect yourselves against the fire that has been prepared for the disbelievers, and remain obedient to God and His Messenger, that you earn mercy and run to advance to the forgiveness of your Lord and to paradise, which is as vast as the heavens and the earth, prepared for the righteous who spend in all circumstances, whether they are in ease or in hardship. And even if they encounter any excesses from those who, whom they spend, they curb their anger and forgive people. These are people who are thorough in their deeds and God befriends those who be for those people who are thorough in their deeds. And such are they that if they commit a lewd act or do something evil to themselves, remember God and seek forgiveness for their sins. And who but God can forgive sins? And do not deliberately persist in what they have done. It is these who shall be rewarded with forgiveness from their Lord and with orchards beneath which streams will flow. They shall dwell there forever. And what a grand reward this is for those who do righteous deeds. So my dear listeners, as you just have gone through this text and translation, you can see how enchanting these words of the Quran are and how moving they are. And uh, the first verse actually is, uh, is spoken in, in reference to the battle of uh, Ohud, in which, of course, uh, uh, the help of God uh, arrived. And uh, it was only after his help that uh, uh, this, the, the victory of the Muslims was, was partially made promise, uh, may, was made possible. So uh, it is in this context that it is said that if in future also you would like to, to have God's help at your disposal, then one of the things that you must not do is which means do not uh, consume interest, doubling it many times over, which means of course, uh, interest which is which is which is charged at an exorbitant rate, and mind you, this doesn't mean that, uh, as has been generally understood from this verse, that perhaps usury is something which the Quran is uh, is prohibiting, because when it is said that do not charge interest at a higher rate or doubling it many times over, people think that if it is charged at a normal rate or a reasonable rate, then the Quran is actually not proscribing or prohibiting uh, interest. So that is not the case. Uh, this style of the Quran has to be understood uh, when a certain, the, when the heinous nature of a certain thing is so uh, is so extreme that at times you have to point it out to make the listeners or the addressees, uh, I mean, to caution and prod them and really make them realize what a mistake they are doing. So it's just like saying that uh, you are speaking, you, you're telling the lies and and that too while standing in a mosque. So what would that mean? Would it mean that you can tell lies when you're standing outside the mosque? No. Of course, telling lies, whether you're inside or outside the mosque, is a, is, is a wrong thing. But when you do something in the mosque, it, it increases the intensity 
uh, of that evil. So in a very similar way, the style which is adopted here, la ta'kulu riba azarafa muzarafa, it doesn't mean that charging interest at a higher rate is being prohibited. It, what it means is that you are charging interest and that too, while doubling, tripling it. So you, you're in the mosque and lying in the mosque and uh, speaking falsehoods. So it's just, uh, uh, and by analogy, you can see what is meant here is not the fact that uh, high interest rate is being prohibited. Now, what is being said is that you're charging interest and that too in, at an ex exorbitant extent. So this is the sense that we have to understand from this verse of the Quran. And uh, it says that uh, uh, this is, if you, if, you would, if you would do something like this, then remember this is something that will not earn you God's help at all. So if you would like to earn God's help, then you fear God, so that you may prosper. And not only you fear God, you see ex exactly in parallel, uh, the words are, So on the one hand, you should fear God uh, from uh, making him displeased with you so that you could prosper. And on the other hand, you should fear the, the hellfire which has been prepared for those who disbelieve. And this is a very common feature of the Quran, as uh, all of you students of the Quran might have now very well noticed that uh, parallel things, they are uh, often juxtaposed together. And whenever the fate of the evildoers is mentioned, immediately after that, the fate of the righteous is mentioned. This is a very common style of the Quran. And here too, uh, that style has been adopted. So uh, after uh, delineating both these fates, it is said, So it is in the best interest of you that you follow God and you follow uh, the messenger. Remember, you had not listened to the messenger in the battle of Ohud uh, when he had uh, deputed you at a certain positions and you had left those positions vacant and which had caused, caused that loss in, in the battle of Ohud. So if you have to prosper, then you have to listen to God and to the messenger. And the point that is being conveyed is that at times the directives which are given to them, they, they, they might seem uh, as if you have done following them while uh, not realizing that uh, it is in the fitness of thing to go to, to, to take great pains in actually following those directives in letter and in spirit and not neglecting them in any way. So it says, Rasul. You have to follow God and His Messenger, لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ And then, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَىٰ مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجِنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَّاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ عِدَّةِ الْمُتَّقِينَ And this, uh, this, the style of this Arabic verse is so beautiful, it's so moving. It says that you run to the forgiveness of your Lord and that forgiveness from your Lord is, is what? Is, is paradise. And the length and breadth of this paradise is like the length of breadth of these heavens and the earth. And it has been prepared for these righteous. It has been prepared for these people who fear the Almighty, who would like to always comply with his directives, uh, not only just to follow those directives, but to follow them in letter and spirit. So, so such is the, this appeal, this, this, the, the words which are used are so... Uh, enchanting, if I would, uh, if I might, I might say, that they they create this inspiration in us, this motivation in us that we have to run to the forgiveness of God and and run to His paradise, and the vastness of paradise is as vast as the heavens and the earth. That of course, referring to the fact that it is beyond our imagination, because the length and breadth of these heavens and the earth is something that we cannot gauge uh, in its proper uh, extent and or iddat lil muttaqin so remember this paradise is something which has been prepared for those who are god fearing for those who are god conscious and then uh, another quality of uh, these uh, muttaqin is then delineated and that is allazina yunfiquna fi sarra'i wa dharra'i wal khazimin al ghayz wal afin anin nas so these are the ones who spend and when they, when they spend, they spend in ease and in hardship. So what happens is that when they spend in, in, a, in these circumstances or the circumstances that they find them in, uh, whether they are in, in circumstances which are conducive, whether they are in circumstances which are, which are, which are, which are, which are 
very, very uh, beneficial to them. They are leading a luxurious life. Or on the other hand, when they are constrained or straightened in their circumstances, they don't withhold their hands. So whatever their situation may be, whatever they have, they don't withhold. And at other instances, uh, we have uh, verses to the effect, So these are the people uh, who spend their wealth morning and evening. Now the word morning and evening, of course, doesn't mean that they spend in the morning and spend in the evening. So these words are, they, they embrace uh, the whole day as if it is said that they are they are on the lookout to spend whenever the time comes, whenever they have the opportunity, which means whether it's hidden or whether it's open, they are always on the lookout to spend. So precisely it is here, it is, uh, the words used are They are the ones who spend, if they are, if they can afford a large amount, of course, even then they spend. And if they are in straightened circumstances, even then, they don't withhold themselves because they think that the test of spending is not the amount. It is actually your own intent and your own sincerity. And uh, whatever you can spare in, in the situation that you are in is most acceptable to God. And then, So what happens is that, as the verse says, that at times when you are uh, spending uh, and, and you encounter any excesses from those whom you whom you whom you spend upon or they spend upon, they, they curb their anger and forgive people. So you you see, this is a very very pertinent advice that at times when you spend on people, and those people at times become rude to you, and this happens in the, in the humdrum of life, uh, in the in the various situations and uh, states of life that we go through. At times, people to whom you do a favor, uh, they don't uh, react or they don't respond in a manner that they should respond later on uh, because of something else that might have arisen. And as a result, you get very angry and you remember that, well, this is the person who I did a favor. This is the person on whom I spent so much money or I gave so much money or I helped that person so much. It is here that uh, we are cautioned and we are told, Al-Kazimin al wal when such is the instance that you feel that anger that you have spent on people and they are being rude to you later on in some other time of life maybe, or in some other situation, and you suddenly remember that in the past you had been very kind to them, then this doesn't warrant that you uh, express your favor to them and you are angry with them. In fact, what the Quran says, well, they forgive people for this uh, anger or this uh, intrepidude. And Wallahu yuhibbul muhsineen, and Almighty God Almighty is one who loves those people who are righteous, who do goodness. And so therefore, uh, spending in the way of God and spending in the way of God that you think that the person with whom, on whom you have spent is someone who's talking back to you and therefore not being thankful enough to you is something which has to be understood in the light of this, that when you're doing something for God, you must forget what the other person's response is. You are doing something purely to please God. And this requires a lot of patience. It requires a lot of commitment. And of course, this, uh, this courage to face adversity and bad manners if they come your way. And then uh, another very important thing is mentioned uh, in, this, in these verses, and that is something that we all have to uh, give air to. And that is, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاهِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهِ فَاسْتَغْفِرُوا لِزُنُوبِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُوا الزُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ SubhanAllah, what a beautiful piece of uh, advice this is. It is that uh, such are they, that if they commit a, a lewd deed or do something evil to themselves, which is وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاهِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ Which means that if they do something which is, uh, which is crossing the limits in sexual affairs and sexual matters, or they are doing something which is unjust to their souls, they, they remember God. They, 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 it is something which makes them immediately realize that they have stumbled into something, and they just immediately withdraw and seek forgiveness for their sins. And And who except God can forgive their sins. So this is what uh, the Almighty wants us. I mean, we just cannot be sinless people. We are not, we are not angels. We are human beings. But if we are 
if we have become indulgent, if we have sexually transgressed, or we have done some other wrong to ourselves, then uh, zakarullah, immediately remember the Almighty, immediately realize our mistake. And, and uh, God says, who else but God is going to forgive you for this? And then another thing is mentioned, which is of tremendous assurance. Uh, in fact, this is an attitude uh, which is uh, which entails this tremendous insurance from God Almighty, and that is Walam Yusirru Alama Falu Wahum Yalamun. And they do not deliberately persist in what they have done. It is these who shall be given forgiveness and who shall be rewarded, as the verse says, Ulaika Jaza Uhum Bakfiratum Mir Rabbihim Majannatun Tajri min Tahti al Anhar. They do not deliberately Persist in what they have done. So what they have done deliberately, I mean, they do not deliberately persist, which means that whatever wrong that they have done, they don't become audacious upon it. They don't uh, continue to do it. Uh, they immediately realize they are, they are not deliberate on their sin. They immediately retract and come back and knock the doors of the Almighty. And this is what uh, makes them true believers, that they don't insist and persist on that sin and immediately come out of it. And this is the sign of a true believer that when he stumbles upon a sin and when he at times deviates uh, and, and that is a deliberate thing that he does, then they don't deliberately persist. I mean, if they do something out of ignorance or out of a willful act, but they don't, do not deliberately persist. The Quran says, وَلَمْ يُسِرُّ عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْمَلُونَ they do not deliberately persist on the wrong they do. And this is a great quality which every humble believer is expected to have. And for such people, it is said, These verses now must have become very familiar to you because they are a description of the, of the paradise which the Almighty has prepared for the righteous. So it says that, and for them is... Forgiveness from their Lord, and they will be rewarded with orchards beneath which streams will flow. They shall dwell there forever. And what a grand reward this is for those who do the who do righteous. Now, uh, when when these words are used in the, in the Quran, remember uh, there's one thing that you need to understand, and otherwise it might be a means of misconception. You often find these words tajri min tahti hal anhar, jannatun tajri min tahti hal anhar, which means orchards beneath which streams flow orchards beneath which streams flow and some people have interpreted this to mean that they would be underground streams below orchards this is not what the quran is implying here if you gather all these verses and also know a bit of the arab culture and the arab mind for them an orchard which would be placed on a high mountain top that would make it uh, more uh, protective against winds and against water would be something of an ideal so when it is said it doesn't mean that these orchards have underground canals it means that these orchards are at great heights they are at at, at mountain tops or at, at hill tops and in the valley of those hills or in the mountains of those hills there are streams so this is the picture so it's not underground canals that are being spoken of here rather what is being said is that the high uh, the high or altitude of these orchards would be such which makes them so beautiful that on the one hand you will be on those, in those orchards and gardens plucking those fruits and you would be peeping down and seeing those streams and, and canals running around the hills uh, of the area in which you would be. So this is just one thing that I intended to clarify because at times this gives the impression that uh, perhaps what the Quran is telling us that paradise will have underground canals. And the last Beautiful words which, with which this uh, passage ends is Wanirma Ajrul Aamilin. And what a grand reward this is for those who do righteous deeds. Of course, uh, grand it is and grand, inshallah, it will be. Uh, let's pray that we are able to be worthy of uh, such a place. We are able to land uh, in such a place. And it is a place that we not only dream of, but we also aspire and uh, make this commitment as uh, we enter these last few days of Ramadan that inshallah what we have done and tried to do in understanding the Quran and making ourselves close to the Quran we will continue with this endeavor for the rest of the 11 months until the next Ramadan uh, arrives and this would be a constant uh, I mean it would be a constant affair in which we are going to read parts of the Quran 
personally or privately, as I would suggest that taking out time of you know, five minutes or seven minutes or 10 minutes, and it's not even necessary to read the Quran in a sequential way. You can just open up the Quran from any part and start reading uh, for, for some time. And this gives you that freshness in your mind. It revives your faith. It makes you as if uh, a rejuvenated person and you feel as if you have been given uh, a spiritual injection, so to speak. So with these words, I end my uh, talk here and I'm, not, I'm now available for your questions. Thank you, Dr. Shazad. Uh, first, I would like to take a written question, which is in connection to a question you answered a few days ago. Um, this is in connection with the faith-based lifestyles and acts of worship Muslims engage with because that is how they have processed their understanding of Islam as a means of showing their devotion to Allah. So uh, in case of the traditions passed down uh, with the notions of hijab and parda, where the two contexts of Surah Nur and Surah Ahzab are conflated, for being a devoted Muslim woman, one has to conform to a particular dress code. In Salafi understanding, it requires women to be covered in black from head to toe with black gloves and socks and a perforated black covering for their eyes. Another visible form around the world is of different headgears that Muslim women sport to cover their hair. But after they interact with the same conflation of ayahs of Surah Nur and Hazab in a different interpretive setup, such as that of the Farai school or by Khalid Abul Fadl, there's a tough internal conflict that they're faced with. A, if there are no such injunctions in the Quran, would their act of adopting a certain modest lifestyle by covering their hair merely for Allah, would that go unrewarded? B, should they continue their practice now as apparently it is now contingent not on faith anymore, but on how comfortable they feel uh, in this current attire due to cultural reasons? So how would you guide this? So I think uh, the, the way to go about understanding these injunctions and following them is to analyze the reasoning behind them. You see, uh, and this is not the right way that you uh, come across various opinions and uh, uh, because of the fact that there are various opinions uh, and uh, one might appeal to you either the, because of the fact that you find the majority following them or you find that perhaps your own parents or your close society was uh, following them or maybe because it's a cultural thing. It could be any other, any number of reasons. The real reason for adopting a particular attire uh, for a Muslim woman or for a Muslim man or for that matter any directive should be what you have understood from the Quran uh, is uh, with, uh, with regards to the verses which speak of uh, this attire. And the best way to do this is to have a very small or a, I mean, take out some time and do some comparative study, uh, because this is going to be just a comparative study that you would do once and for all. Of course, there could be evolution as well. But basically, it would be a one time study to start off with in which you compare one or two or three contesting opinions and see what they say and what is the reason behind whatever they are recommending, whether it's like a full burqa or a perforated burqa with eyes there, or it's like head covering or not a head covering or a face veil or not a face veil. So uh, when I was uh, discussing this uh, topic, I think I remember that I analyzed the two contesting opinions uh, or the three contesting opinions uh, in this particular, in these particular verses. And I gave the uh, the arguments which are given by the proponents of these schools of thought from their books. And uh, I think if the purpose was to make you choose and, uh, and make your own selection that which one of those are the ones that you should select. So I think that uh, it's a question of your own intellect that you must use. And don't be afraid that if you would choose something wrong, that uh, then that would be the end of it. No, that's not going to be the end of it because if you do it something sincerely, if the choice is not out of any convenience or self-interest, but it is because of what you have truly intellectually understood and it made sense to you, then even if it was ultimately wrong, even then uh, the Quran tells us that uh, the Almighty would treat you to what you believed, how true you were to your own understanding. So whatever you understood, did you follow that understanding? That is going to be the real test. And this, I, I say, is the one of the tests that all of us are put through. We are not just put through the trial of life, for example, in, uh, by various calamities like, like, being, like poverty or sickness or the passing away of a dear departed. No, uh, we, we are also put to the, to, to the trial of knowledge. And that is 
what I call the quest for the truth, to find out what the truth is in religious matters. And that is another form of trial that all of us face. And there are, if I enumerate, maybe 10 or 15 instances in which there are major differences in interpretation. And because of this, uh, I made it a point to give some lectures, not only on the Quran, but also on the Hadith, because these major differences either rely on an interpretation of a particular passage of the Quran or certain ahadis. And I have covered the ahadis uh, to a greater extent, and inshallah, I'll be covering the Quran. I, have, I, I, I think I've covered some uh, aspects which are very important to life, and there are some remaining which I, I shall cover. And I'm sure there are a lot of other academicians who have done this, which from which you can benefit. There are books also, but this is the way forward. So take it as a challenge that you would like to understand what exactly is the Quran, because our test is to what to understand what the Quran tells us and what we have understood from the Quran and forget what other people think of, even if they make fun of you or they criticize you. That's something that you all of us have to go through. The prophets of God had gone through much worse things. So take this as a, as a challenge, study and analyze and to the best of, of your ability, adopt what appeals to your intellect and understanding the most. Thank you, Dr. Stab. It's a very delicate line one has to pass because, uh, again, when you are adopting a different school of thought, you know, but you have to live in a collectivist society. So it is a very big conundrum that people are faced with. Thank you. Uh, Fatma, would you like to please uh, go forward with your question? Assalamu alaikum. My question is a follow up question for my yesterday's question. So basically, you said that. Uh, the man is the head of the family and uh, what I understand from the 34th ayat of Surah Nisa is that that is because, because he bears the financial responsibility. Like it said that Mard and women are brave and that Allah has given a lot of money and that they have spent their money on their own. So if that's the reason then in circumstances where the woman is bearing the financial responsibility and the man is not working at all, or if he's working, he's contributing very little. Like it's the woman who is bearing all the financial responsibility. So in that situation, would the woman be the head of the family and the man has to be compliant to her? Is it, is it related to who is bearing the financial responsibility? I think I explained this yesterday that it is not just the financial responsibility part which makes the husband the head of the family. There are two things which are mentioned and you just read those two things separately in your translation. So the first of them is Bima Faddalallahu Ba'adahum Ala Ba'ad because one is made more superior to the other in certain things and because they spend on their family. So there are two things. So the first is that whether they spend or not, I mean, this is just one disqualification if they are not properly catering for their family, uh, if they are misusing authority, of course, this would be make them liable before the Almighty. Uh, uh, this would not actually disturb the balance of the family, I would say, but it would severely uh, put the, I mean, make the family go through a lot of stress because the, because the husband is not following what he has been told to. But then, as I said, there are two things which make the husband eligible to be the head of the family. The first thing is that husbands in general are temperamentally, physiologically, psychologically, uh, mentally, I mean, they, they are more suitable for this job to head the family as decision makers. So this is a separate clause and this is the first condition. So even if the husband is not contributing much I mean, there could be several reasons for this. One is that he is, I mean, maybe he's sick, maybe uh, he doesn't, he's working and he's still in, in the process of finding a job. Or the third is that he's a complete, uh, uh, I mean, a person who is, uh, who was given up on his family and he's not the right sort of a person and he's left everything to the wife, which of course is going to turn the balance of decisions also and a lot of things in, in a very, in a very grave manner. That is going to upset some of the decisions. But because of the fact that the Quran does not merely say that financially supporting someone is the, is the sole reason for him to become the head of the family, the other part in which it says that because of the fact that men are more 
suitable for this job so these are the two reasons given so i in my personal opinion think and my understanding is that unless both these opinions uh, are somehow done away with uh, i mean both these aspects are done away with which of course would mean that a, maybe a husband has lost his senses totally and, uh, and he is of course not earning uh, then only perhaps this could be an automatic choice otherwise if one of them is still there uh, uh, that would not be sufficient to make the the wife the head of the family i would say that even like in apparently abusive relationships where the man is not making any money and he's alcoholic and whatever still the woman mm. is uh, required to be compliant to him remember the compliance that we discussed was uh, something in detail yesterday so the, what does what exactly the compliance means i mean she has her own uh, life to live she can take decisions which relate to her person like for example being a professional following a particular lifestyle having a particular religious view so there are certain independent traits which which as human do i would say these are human rights which are invested by the almighty in for every human being so we are not talking about those rights so if you remember our last night's discussion we were talking about issues in which there is a deadlock and that deadlock relates more to administrative issues than to the issues uh, which we generally make uh, i mean wrongly estimate that they are the ones which come under this verse so not only has this verse been misinterpreted uh, for other reasons but one of the reasons of misinterpreting or one of the misinterpretations of this verse is that this uh, verse actually virtually gives husbands the authority to dictate the life pattern the life choices and uh, all the priorities of life which wives have which is not of course what this verse is speaking of which i tried to clarify yesterday it is basically that those administrative decisions which are mostly administrative in which there is a deadlock that uh, the husband has the casting vote so i think if you uh, understand this fact and uh, if you referring to the fact that there are abusive relationships yes that's another issue issue so if in an abusive relationship uh, of course uh, being the head of the family i mean this hardly matters when a person is doing something so bad that he is abusing or maybe even uh, uh, lifting his hands on his wife uh, then these this is a, this such such a extreme situation then it hardly matters who is the head or whether he is behaving as, as the head because he is not behaving like a head he is actually behaving like a tyrant uh, uh, which he would be taken to task and even laws can be enacted in a in a state if if a husband is behaving like this then he could he, be, he could be called by the court and and question for this uh, abuse of power so i think we need to clearly understand that this verse is not limiting the personal freedom of wives in any way that's a personal space that every woman has and if a husband tries to use this verse to limit that freedom he in my humble opinion is misusing this verse thank you dr shahzad we have a question about um, the permissibility of giving zakat or sadqa so it uh, relates to both sadqa to fitr and general sadqa so the question says whom should we give zakat or sadqa at the time of fasting uh, relatives or neighbors should the sadqa be given to relatives or neighbors who should be given preference this this is a this is a call that a person has to make himself or herself uh, there is no rule of thumb at times i mean i think the need or the nature of the need perhaps should govern this uh, this disbursement at times uh, maybe your neighbor who might be very close to you he's very he's, he's next door uh, he's the most needy in certain situations and uh, at other instances it could be your own close relatives and still other instances it could be your own people your domestic staff so you see uh, i mean this is a choice that you need to make yourself keeping in view the need of the people that are around you and the nature of that need i mean is, is something which is at times so i mean it's so clear that it is not difficult at all to make a choice thank you i hope this must have made it clear shiraz ahmed you may have your question now thank you assalam alaikum shahzad bhai badhiya shahzad bhai i have two three very simple single liner questions and hopefully the answers will be single liner as well Number one, uh, the impression I got from Quranic Kareem is that Jannat is not the name of a place, 
one of the names used in Quran is Firdaus. So when the term is used in Quran, Jannatul Firdaus, it means gardens of Firdaus. So the name is Firdaus, or maybe one of the name is Firdaus, and gardens are just a description of how the place is going to look like. Right? Is this understanding correct? So when it says Jannatul Firdaus, it means gardens of Eden, gardens of eternity, gardens which are going to stay forever. This is the meaning. Otherwise, uh, the description of uh, paradise is is, a, is basically a description of an orchard, of a of a countryside place in which you are enjoying yourselves. So the word Firdaus is not only at times used uh, synonymously, but it also has that uh, uh, that implication of gardens of eternity, as you say, gardens of Eden. If you consult any uh, translation, you'll find. Uh, words like gardens of eden or gardens of eternity being translated so it's like saying that these are the these are places which would be eternal and they would be beautiful places uh, like countryside places and uh, because of the fact that of course we can only make it we can only imagine uh, something which is analogous in our own in our own uh, space which of course are orchards that we are used to or the gardens that we see so therefore the comparison is not perfect but I would say that this is basically gardens of eternity that is being mentioned here. Okay, so what does that mean? Uh, is Jannat uh, the name of the place or description? Jannat is just, the, is, it, it depends on where it is used. Uh, the fact is that there is not going to be just one orchard. Uh, the word the word which are used is uh, at times are waliman khafa rabbahu jannatan which means they'll have two orchards or maybe more than that so there are several places or several sections of paradise so i would say that it's a space and that space it has the outlook of of a paradise of of a, of a garden of an orchard but there would be different levels uh, as the Quran clearly tells us that they were, are uh, different levels and each level will have its different uh, uh, facilities. For example, we know that the paradise which will belong to the Sabiqun will have certain characteristics which is mentioned in Surah Waqiyah. And the paradise of the, uh, the Ashab al yamin would be slightly lesser and its characteristics are also spelled out in Surah Waqiyah and Surah Rahman. So I think you should, uh, we should imagine it to be a space uh, whose outlook would be like an orchard uh, or like a garden and it will have various uh, uh, levels and stages depending upon who is going to be placed where uh, as the Quran says uh, but because of the fact that it is generally whenever, whenever it is described the words used is al jannat or jannat which it is either an orchard or orchards so therefore the space that we can actually visualize is that that space will be something of a some, some sort of a orchard or a garden uh, or a group of gardens that would be, we would be blessed with because and, and again as i said this is an a, this is an area in which we have to i mean we cannot just uh, run amok in our imagination because uh, it's actual reality will be something that we can only uh, be able to see and witness when we go there but we have some idea that it's a space of unbounding pleasure and and facilities and luxuries and it would be because the Arabs were used to, uh, whenever they would think of luxurious places, they would think of countrysides and orchards and trees and crops and plantations. So this is how it is generally described in the Quran. But one extra thing which is always described is that which means that if beyond gardens and beyond orchards, you would like some other place. I mean, there are so many places that you enjoy, which are which would not be garden-like, which would not be orchard-like. So the Quran tells us that you will be able to even have that. So because the foremost addressees of the Quran were the Arabs, and to the Arabs, the the most rewarding thing or the most enchanting thing would be a, would be an orchard. So the paradise has been mentioned. The description of paradise is according to their imagination, and with this description or with this addition that for the rest of the times people should not think that if 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 i mean it's not going to be just orchards it would be anything that you can imagine it could be i mean anything that comes to your mind it could be a racing track that you can set up there it could be a a, a safari there or whatever so <laughs> way the way the word uh, paradise is mentioned please do remember this that the foremost addressees of the quran were the arabs and the, and for them this was the description that was uh, that actually appealed to them, and hence the Quran used those words 
and le- and made that sentence come after it so that we, we people living centuries after them if we don't think that uh, orchards or gardens are something that we can enjoy or it's there's something which, which are ultimate then we are given this option well whatever comes to your mind you will be given that uh, thank you shall be just another single line question and that's my last question generally it's understood that in the month of ramadan you know uh, devils are kept away from us in whatever form they are chained up or whatever uh, i'm not going into the terminologies but i want to understand the concept at individual mm-hmm. level it means that if i'm in pakistan and ramadan started and going to end on certain dates that the devils uh, their effect on me is kind of minimized or is it global level that in this world in this year the, uh, the first date of ramadan and the last date of ramadan inclusive of all the countries together those devils will be chained up and put at some place what's the actual concept behind this chaining up thank you obviously the month of ramadan is going to occur geographically in different dates and so therefore it is the month of ramadan which has been talked about regarding all geographic locations wherever muslims are fasting that sulsilat al shayatin which means that they are in chained they are put in fetters and uh, the way they are given the chance in normal life to whisper evil suggestions you was be so fi sudur in nas and cause all sorts of uh, uh, conspiracies and make a mess out of your own thoughts they are they are i mean fettered and and chained so that at least uh, the attack that they normally do uh, in the remaining 11 months is warded off and now the only thing that you need to fight is your own nafs or your own inner desires so you see this itself is a beautiful uh, incentive given by god or it's like a bonus given by god that in normal times of the year you have two big trials one is the trial from those devils who are always whispering evil suggestions and i mean they're always around you doing something and the other is from your own nafs so in this particular month the only thing that you need to combat is your nafs and as far as the those devils are concerned which which try to lead you astray god says that they are really in chain and i in my understanding i think that this is not a metaphor it's not something of a a symbolic thing it is an actual thing which means that these uh, devils who normally are able to uh, i mean lead people astray by whispering evil suggestions in this particular month wherever wherever geographically geographically ramadan is following at all those places for people who are fasting this is a facility or a bonus which the almighty has provided Sir, just to confirm, the second part of the answer was that, for example, in Pakistan, if tomorrow is the end of Ramadan, and at some other geographical place, they 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 have to uh, fast for two more days. Then, for me, it, the devil can affect okay. me now. Of course, because your month of Ramadan has finished, so it's 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 it is the it is the geographical place uh, that is the real uh, of importance. Because once you uh, I mean go out of Ramadan, for you that facility has been taken away. so for other areas for which are fasting for one more day or two more days it is still there so it's like in the month of ramadan the, the word itself says that for the month of ramadan this is done and because this month varies from location to location so i would think that this is what it means that wherever that month is as long as it is there this bonus is provided okay nostrad khwaja you can have your question now yeah assalam alaikum doctor wa alaikum assalam i am confused and i need your advice mm-hmm. i go to tarawi and i listen to quran my mm-hmm. arabic understanding is nil almost um so i re- i listen to the quran yes it's being recited and i'm listening attentively but don't do not understand a word or maybe few words only would Is, and i always think is it better for me to sit somewhere and read quran with translation to understand what allah taala is telling me alternately uh, either read myself or listen to a talk for example ghamdi saab's talk or your talk on the youtube or some what is i think what will give me more uh uh understanding of what allah taala is telling me is by listening to the talks or the translation reading the translations myself but tarawi 
standing there just listening to the arabic and just going over my head i'm not really gaining any understanding of what allah taala is telling me or telling me to do or what is your uh, opinion about it well i think uh, you have to uh, first make this uh, understanding clear that when tarawi was uh, actually suggested or implemented so to speak by the caliph umar in his times uh, there was no question of people not understanding the quran because they were automatically aware of the uh, quran because they were well versed in arabic this is a situation which has resulted in in countries uh, in which the uh, national language or the language of understanding is not arabic and as a result uh, we find ourselves in this fix and this fix that you are talking about is faced by a number of uh, muslims and uh, uh, a number of i mean things that you can uh, say in response and i cannot offer you the options are uh, various and i can uh, enumerate a couple of them for example you have to also understand that uh, the prayer is of two parts and the prayer has two parts one are the utterances which means whatever is read in the prayer and the second is the posture of the prayer you kneel you prostrate you stand you sit uh, you sit between the prostrations so a prayer is composed i mean when you when you're uh, standing before god it's not just the utterances that uh, are going to matter i mean they are not the sole part of the prayer so kneeling prostrating standing sitting they themselves are what we call rituals of the prayer so even if you're not understanding parts of the quran and because in tarawi this becomes a, a major part because you might be understanding surah fatiha you might be understanding some of the other things but the large uh, chunk of the quran which is read is something which might go over you or you would just care to listen to it so so one approach could be that okay as far as i can maybe not the whole 8 or 20 rakats i would i would rather do offer four or six or eight or whatever the number that you can thinking the fact that well i'm not just uh, uh, concentrating on what the uh, what the imam is reciting uh, i'm also in doing as i said those uh, those rituals of the prayer so this could be one one area the second is of course that uh, you skip the ravi and you get up at the, early in jud or if you're not able to uh, do it in the hajjud you can pray isha at your home and uh, uh, you can read the quran while standing and the musaf is open in in front of you and when you're glancing through it i mean you can glance through the translation as well and uh, read it put it on a on a table and then do your rest of the prayer and then when you get up you can again get hold of the quran and read it from the musaf with the translation and 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 and, and follow it like that as you said and a third could be as you said that uh, you do it simply by understanding the quran without even standing in prayer and uh, just opening up the quran with a translation a fourth could be you could listen to a scholar uh, on 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 tv or on your computer or wherever uh, so these are the options but do remember i mean uh, this these these are these are the problems which have arisen because of the fact that we uh have been educated in a way that arabic is not a language that is understandable to a large part of the muslim population so these these are various ways that you can adopt but outrightly rejecting the tarawi simply because you think that you're not understanding i have the, i just wanted to make that point that do remember that if you are able to stand up even for four rakats or six rakats not the whole maybe and you what you can do is you can also mix and match you can pray some part with the behind the imam in which you are of course doing those rituals then you can come back and uh, do it part of it yourself by holding the musaf either at the isha time or more uh, appropriately if you are able to do so get up, getting up a little earlier in sehri and then reading the musaf uh, directly with the translation so i think these are some of the some of the options that i can that i that come to my mind and i often suggest but uh, ultimately the choice is yours because you see what you need to understand is that all this is an optional act i mean it's an optional worship ritual whether it's the tahajjud or the tarawi or uh, reading the quran it is a highly rewarding thing obviously and obviously this reward would be uh, ultimate when you understand what you are reading but if you also keep in mind that it is a mixture of reading and those postures in which you are 
I mean, just imagine yourself prostrating before God. You're placing your forehead on the ground. This is an ex an, a huge acknowledgement of your humility that you are, you are nothing before God. When you're kneeling, it's like that. So if you have those emotions with you while praying, while, even when you're not fully understanding what the Imam is saying, uh, I would say that you're not completely losing out on, on the Taravi or, 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 the, or the benefits of the Taravi, I would say. Thank you, Rosh I'm reminded that in some parts of Karachi, actually, the practice that after Taravi, uh, the tafsir of this uh, yes. red ayahs are also performed. Yes. There is a nuance, another nuance to the question that was asked earlier about Sadka. If both of uh, the population, for example, the neighbors and their relatives are in the same kind of position, uh, monetary-wise, financial need, so who shall be given preference in this case? You said if uh, the, two, the two sections are, are, the, are, the, are, are the relatives and what are the other ones? Who are the, the other neighbors, ones? The neighbors. Well, you see, this is again a call that you have to make. I mean, I, we externally, uh, because you see, there are these are subjective things at times. At times, you have objectivity when you see that the need of one is more than the other. So this becomes very objective. And then at times it becomes subjective. But the guidance that we have been given in general, if we keep the spirit of religion in mind, is the people who are related to you, they have more right on you. So therefore, uh, if you if I am given, given the choice between a, in, between a relative and a neighbor, and if it's an equal sort of a thing, so I will go for the relative because a relative has more right on me as per the book of God. Thank you. Uh, Muhammad Asif Gumra, you may have your question now. Uh, yeah, Jazakallah, Rav Sahib, and uh, good questions by the participant. Uh, my question is that we are building a mosque in our area. And we normally go for fundraising and sometimes we go for fundraising at, uh, yesterday I was at uh, one of the big DC, you know, grocery stores, very big one, where the, all denominations of people come. Then one of the sick donated money, so what you are asking, what, 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 what you guys are doing? I said, we are building the mosque in medieval area. And I said, okay. So he donated and one Hindu family, young family gave it give money to his two-year-old son to put into the box and they know that we are building the mosque. So what this act, where they stand in, I know is a philosophically and religiously we are said, I'm, I do not know how to rate it. You know, I, I was quite impressed with the deeds. I think, I think it's a beautiful gesture. I mean, uh, I mean, this is something of an outstanding gesture. And uh, why, why not? Uh, why shouldn't? And we should reciprocate as well. If they are being, bring, building temples or maybe their own Gurdwaras, uh, if you donate for them. Because you see, uh, minorities are protected by the state. And this, if the state give, grants them money to build their temples or to build their Gurdwaras or to build their worship places, uh, this is the responsibility which the state can take up for its minorities. So if the state can do that, uh, as citizens, we can also reciprocate by donating for their worship places. Yeah, because, because they are uh, minorities. Yeah. So this is, this is quite impressive to me because that was the first time experience. I and it's, it's, uh, I don't think so that a Muslim will going to feel to donate into a temple. I mean, generally speaking, I'm just saying, uh, as what we, we, we've been grind. That is precisely, that, that is precise, uh, in my humble opinion, a slightly prejudiced attitude because you see what you're doing is you are i mean if the state is responsible because you see remember zakat is to be given to the state and the state is going to be responsible for i'm talking about a nation state sure. a nation state is responsible to protect every citizen and to provide basic facilities for them uh, regarding their collective lives so if, if it is going to start a mosque if a nation state, so to speak, I mean, the, the nation state, whether, let's, let's forget about whether it's a Muslim or not, any nation state, if it is going to provide for the worship places of Muslims, mm -hmm. then it should provide for the worship places of, I mean, for the Jews, synagogues and churches and temples. So if that money can be given by the state that we pay to them and mm -hmm. then dispersed uh, these places, so in places where the state is not collecting uh, uh, zakat or tax the way we find in many non uh, in many Muslim third world countries, mm -hmm. uh, it's just on behalf of the state that we are doing the same thing. So okay. I my personal view in this is that if you give money as a or a 
or any place of worship is i think it's it's it's, it's something that cannot be objected to i might one might not feel com- comfortable that's another thing yeah. but i personally think that discomfort or comfort is one thing and prohibition is another thing yeah because we are we are in the building right now and we we are renting the church and church you guys church people are very much generous in providing all the facility to us to you know do friday prayers and taravi in the church and we have a very good inter- interfaith relationship with the them and the other local communities you know non i mean non muslim others the hindus and other in the very we are we are very very close understanding so i thought i'd bring it into the light that you know that we other other participants have a perspective on it as well so jazakallah for your you know take on it thank you uh, fatma you may ask a second question now yes i want to ask that uh, we are we have been stopped to prostrate during the zawal time but what about uh, like reading quran or reading something on the tasbih and also what's the reality of walking in front of a namaz So first of all uh, there is no such thing as zawal time uh, and there is no such thing as any prohibition of zawal time this is a misconception that is very common the only times of uh, prohibition of uh, prostration and that is prostration uh, you can still read the quran uh, prostration is sunrise and sunset this is only in our uh, subcontinent and some other muslim countries where we regard zawal to be a part of uh, a prohibited or the prohibited time of prayer because uh, it is the opinion of some of the Han- hanafi jurists imam malik for example never said this and he lived in medina and if we uh, if we collate all the sources we'll find that there is abs- there is a misconception and that has arisen because of a hadith so the hadith uh, says that abridu zuhur this was these are the words of the prophet which means that cool down your zuhur prayer or let offer your zuhur prayer when when the sun descends and it's slightly cooler and uh, if you s- s- collect collect all these uh, narratives you'll find that this is not, not something which the prophet is telling people religiously it is more of an advice keeping the keeping in view the immense heat which was in the times uh, which in those times in the sandy de- desert of arabia uh, uh, i mean it was literally it would you, you it would burn your skin and it was very harsh even today the, the, such is the case so the, the prophet was basically advising muslims to offer the zuhur prayer at a less hot time when the sun is descending and by mixing up these narratives people came up with the idea that perhaps the prophet is telling us that this time of the sun's descent which is called zawal is a prohibited time this is not the case so the only prohibited time is sunrise and sunset and that too for prostration you can read the quran uh, or any other uh, ibadah other than prostration because what ha- what happens in sunrise and sunset is that uh, idolatrous nations they would prostrate before the sun uh, at sunrise and sunset and by the way there are many chinese sects even today who have this this ritual of of uh, of, ha- of expressing devotion to the sun uh, at at these times so don't think that this has gone away from this uh, planet as yet so that is the reason i i'm forgetting your last question uh what's the reality of walking in front of a namazi like yeah. when you're so on the namaz at home okay. okay what happened was that this is again, again a very very uh i would say i mean uh, for lack of a better word i say it's it's quite hilarious uh, hilarious misconception and the reason i say it's hilarious is that uh, because of gross misunderstanding again some of the, the things that occurred in the time of the prophet you see the the janimas or the prayer mat this is a recent invention there were no prayer mats at the time of the prophet i mean they were the, the they, it was a in in the masjid in the mosque of navi they had those gravel stones which were spread on the floor other than that they would have a, a rough sort of a cloth that might would have they would they were spread so the concept of prayer mat was not there at the, in those times so the prophet said if when you are praying you just stick a sutra the word sutra in arabic means the place just before you can do sajda you can prostrate and uh, it was said well don't know, anyone if he if you are praying at times people don't realize you are praying so people must not cross between you while you are standing and the place on which i mean the right direct place on which you are supposed to prostrate which is which is to be guarded or or to be uh, actually signified by a small piece of wood 
or something that would be put there. And basically the prohibition was to walk as if uh, the prophet was saying, don't, don't pro walk on the prayer mat. Don't walk on, on the space which is between the person who is standing and the place on which he's going to prostrate. This is what the prophet had said. As far as walking after that is concerned, as today might be the case, for example, when we are praying, we have a prayer mat and that prayer mat automatically outlines the uh, final place that we are going to prostrate. So that itself is a sutra. Sutra is an Arabic word which means a place which is or a, or a mark which is guarded, uh, which is stuck in the ground to, to signify a certain benchmark. So as far as passing beyond that benchmark is concerned, which is beyond the place of your prostration, it is fine. I mean, you can still show respect because it might uh, uh, cause uh, disruption in one's concentration. So uh, that's another thing. But Today, people think that even passing in front of the uh, uh, namazi or a prayer person or a person doing the prayer after that prayer mat is, is going to entail 40 years of punishment in hell, as is uh, spoken by our, many of our sermonizers. That is absolutely is, is a gross misunderstanding. So if I sum up the, what the prophet intended was that no one should pass between the person and the, uh, and the place between uh, on which he's going to prostrate that part of the earth. And this is ob ob obviously very logical. Why should one pass on that on that on that space? But beyond that space, it is fine. I mean, it is fine that you can do. However, if you think that this could disturb the person's concentration, okay, you can walk behind him. But it bears no label of prohibition. The label of prohibition is borne by that space in which you were to offer the sajda. So I, I've gone in a little more detail in explaining this question because this is such a huge misconception and. I can see people when they pray in their mosques uh, and they would like to go back and cross over. They keep standing and waiting for the previous namazi to finish his prayer. And at times they have to, I mean, literally they don't go to the first saf, which has a lot of reward because they think that if they have to get out early, they have to, I mean, cross people and say what, so what they do is they choose to pray in the last row and don't realize that, I mean, the further you go, the further reward that you get. So you sacrifice the reward because you're in a hurry and you know that hurry, I mean, can only be catered for if you're standing in the last row. So this is the, this is the price that people pay by not understanding that this, this never was the practice of, uh, or never was a directive of the prophet. Thank you, Dr. Shazad. Thank you for answering all our questions. That's the end of the lineup of questions today. Okay. Inshallah tomorrow. <laughs>